Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 263 at block height 677,910, Sunday, April 5th. So, what is up today, gang? Well, today is a day of many anniversaries. Very Well, for one, it is Satoshi's birthday, and of course, Satoshi's birthday, we believe, was chosen to follow the issuance of the 6102 order about uh, seizing uh, personal gold. Uh, Then there is also the anniversary of collateral murder uh, 11 years ago. That explains the 6102 trolling I saw on Twitter today. Yep. Not, Not a happy day very unhappy day it almost makes me want to make a specific star wars sound effect that i can't do quite accurately is that a wookie noise my pathetic attempt at it um i just can't can't make those those frequency ranges i just can't you should try it in a mask that might help (laughs) <laughs> get a bunch of people to review your wookie sound and then even if they disagree with you keep it up on your website anyway <laughs> it's hard yeah. to impersonate a wookie yeah we, we but, should get real explicit with this though i feel like this this warrants a uh, public service announcement mm-hmm. if anybody's worried about your hardware wallet, do your own research, and you'll find out that the most recommended in the space are probably a more secure choice than using a computer. Yep. So I guess just a TLDR for people not paying attention. Um, So JW security expert, Wookie man, Weatherman, has put together a new site coded by his 14 year old daughter or wait a minute is it his 15 year old son or is he divorced or married i don't know because the story about his personal life seems to just change completely every month um but yeah he he put together a website um and went around to people like guy swan zach herbert from foundation devices um leo i i forget his last name apologies um who maintains the wallet scrutiny website and he went around quietly in private asking all of them um opinions about different wallets and such and then put all of their faces um up on this website endorsing his ridiculous yeti cold five of seven multi-sig setup that none of these people actually used beyond uh, three people i think actually used and tested that but all of the people um are now sitting on that website as endorsing yeti cold when they have done no such thing and jw is completely refusing to remove their faces their fake endorsements of his bullshit hack job python script and yeah this is this is just um this guy's a complete scammer and we've said this for years at this point um it should be really obvious looking at this right now that we're kind of telling the truth here so I think he's supposedly exploiting a different child's labor this time. If I remember what I read, it was a 14-year-old daughter this time, as opposed to a 15-year-old son. The website is phenomenal. You go there, 
and it recommends you use three different wallet services, maybe most of which are hosted, maybe all of which are hosted. And if you toggle a little slider, it'll recommend a more secure way, in quotes, to store your Bitcoin, which is Yeti cold. And then there's like 20 crypto influencer faces down below that JW is trying to ride the coattails of. People, if you're thinking about enhancements to Bitcoin Core, you probably do not want to use a couple hundred lines of Python and shell scripts written by one guy and reviewed by nobody. There are a lot of better options out there to enhance Bitcoin Core. Uh, one of the recent ones written in Python is called Spectre. Spectre desktop. It's pretty cool. It also enables you to do multi-sigs. The interface is slick. I highly recommend you check it out, but there are many other options. But if you think somebody through the benefits of their heart is going to enhance your Bitcoin core experience with their personal scripts that they'll happily bring over to your house and install for you, I, I would be very skeptical of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, I've uh, added a bunch of links to the show notes on this topic. We're gonna, not going to go through all of them. It's just for people who have not heard about the story of this guy before. But if you want to hear a short version of it, uh, I actually talked about this in episode 256, uh, around the one hour mark in the episode, like a short summary. Um, and so we're not going to go into it today. But yeah, again, like we've warned about this guy for a couple years now uh don't don't trust his judgment or advice or even who he says he is uh so don't follow his advice and i think misrepresenting people's endorsements is pretty damning and clear evidence that he's willing to shift words around to get what he wants uh despite literally having an entire thread of people complaining to him that they're using that he's using their name and images to promote his own tools so that's pretty bad hey, but i'm gonna get a quantum computer and i'm gonna guess all the bitcoin keys and then all your bitcoin is mine i'm a security expert i'm gonna get the launch codes while you're at that <laughs> for those who don't know that is not how quantum computers work they take the public key and from that can guess the private key. They can't just guess all the private keys. Also, uh, I mean, Shinobi, I don't know if I ever actually brought this up to you, but um, once we were pretty straight on him not being a good actor, I actually went back through our entire video archive and added a, a disclaimer about him to the description. Every video that he was in, I added a warning that uh yes he is not yes he was once a co-host a couple of years ago on our show for about six months or so and he is no longer and there are very good reasons for that and so we keep warning people because he built his reputation beyond us uh without our input so yep, that was absolutely the right call where of wookies and others who would steal your bitcoins Also, I mean, in general, if you're just, uh, I don't know, if you just have a fetish for a grown man wearing a uh, Wookiee mask or a Darth Vader mask and, and talking about cryptocurrency, I guess you can go back and look at that. But um, yeah. Probably just end up causing brain damage. Alrighty, though. So warnings for Wookiees out of the way. FUD. What are these legacy douchebags doing here? Let's see. In paper Bitcoin land, we have news this week that PayPal has launched their, I don't know, promoted since last fall, uh, soon to be offering. You can now pay merchants with cryptocurrency that lives in your PayPal account. Ta-da! PayPal has upgraded its databases. It now supports Bitcoin internal transfers. So wait, instead of just adding and subtracting Bitcoin in my column of the spreadsheet, I can move it to other people's columns? 
it's almost like double entry accounting. Oh my God. It's revolutionary. Congrats to all the merchants. I hope you get lots of Bitcoins. I think there is a singular <clears throat> important aspect of this that will wholly decide whether or not this is used or completely ignored. Are PayPal going to be whiny little faggots who run off to the IRS and tattle on you every time you spend $5 in Bitcoin? I don't see why not. They definitely will have a record of it for when the IRS comes knocking. More on that later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think PayPal will. And to kind of, you know, pivot into the next one that is somewhat related here, um, Cash App <clears throat> just rolled out um, internal Bitcoin sends. And from my understanding, um, they're going to continue only reporting sales into fiat um, and not every little transaction. So if PayPal goes the other way and starts reporting all the little transactions, um, that kind of puts a lot of pressure on Cash App to do the same. And pivot. <clears throat> oh, look what Cash App is... Um, is doing they're trying to hire a bitcoin transaction monitoring analyst um full-time in st louis missouri um you can work remotely um but yeah um they're looking for a bitcoin transaction monitoring analyst to join square and support the continued build out and evolution of our cash app compliance transaction monitoring team <clears throat> the mission of the transaction compliance monitoring team at Square is to perform ongoing anti-money laundering monitoring and other ongoing reviews to meet our regulatory payment network and partnership requirements. We actively monitor to ensure the safety and soundness of the Square system and maintain a healthy, compliant user base. <clears throat> In this role, you will support the Cash App Compliance Transaction Monitoring Team by monitoring customer Bitcoin activity across the Cash App platform for potentially suspicious activity. You will collaborate with the compliance team to ensure compliance with the applicable laws, regulations, and industry best practices. Um, what's his qualification? Oh, even better in the qualification setup, knowledge and familiarity with chain analysis and elliptic. Yay! So this is this is interesting because um, Cash App has kind of been one of the platforms not really going crazy with this, um, not having any problems with coin join deposits and shit. Well, I don't see that continuing. Do you guys? Oopsies. It's maybe like um, <clears> hmm, <throat> maybe like just because it's a Jack Dorsey Silicon Valley company doesn't mean that this company is going to just buck all the regular no they're going to do the same shit all the other fucking businesses do yay here's them trying to hire the guy to do that they should give him about 300 days of vacation a year or her real quick job jack dorsey the hero of bitcoin oh no wait he's just running another on and off ramp that does kyc Bankers definitely gonna bank, kids. Be careful of having too much brand loyalty around here. I mean, this just, you know, this makes me ask the question um, now, is Cash App ever going to try and play the game of implement um, the lightning strike stack? I mean, if, if they're going in this direction, they're specifically hiring a guy for this role. And I mean, come on. Um, familiarity with chain analysis and elliptic means those are the platforms Cash App is using. I wonder if it has something to do with transaction limits uh, as well, because they let you take off something like $5,000 a week, right? It may well be to increase that they feel like they need more surveillance capabilities or such. And maybe that's because they're hitting magic government 
uh, transaction limit numbers or something. I have no idea. Well, as much as I would like that to be the case, I'm not assuming positive outcomes or reasons when I see businesses in this space do this kind of shit. Especially just given the overall um, hanging FATF shit and general regulatory landscape right now. Yeah, there's definitely storms on the horizon. And, you know, yeah, I think that leads into the next one with you, Ginny. I was making my window big enough. Um, Yeah, so on uh, April 1st, the Department of Justice announced that a federal court in the District of Massachusetts entered an order today authorizing the IRS to serve a John Doe summons on Circle Internet Financial, Inc., or its predecessors, uh, subsidiaries, divisions, and affiliates, including Poloniex LLC, collectively Circle, seeking information about U.S. taxpayers who conducted at least the equivalent of $20,000 in transactions in cryptocurrency during the years 2016 to 2020. The IRS is seeking the records of Americans who engaged in business with or through Circle, a digital currency exchange headquartered in Boston. Now, of course, if everyone may remember, I believe that $20,000 was the same kind of lower threshold um that they had for their request to coinbase years Mm -hmm. ago is that correct it was 20k yeah Yeah. and uh of course some people may be wondering why 20k and obviously the reason for this usually is that if you're doing more than twenty thousand dollars in transactions on coinbase uh the chances that uh maybe you didn't report that correctly and that the irs may be owed a chunk of that uh that is worth fighting for increases so this is purely just a kind of cost uh you know uh kind of efficiency of you know highest reward uh lowest amount of effort of going through a list of people who are users so Uh, It continues, tools like the John Doe summons uh, authorized today send the clear message to U.S. taxpayers that the IRS is working to ensure that they are fully compliant in their use of virtual currency. From Chuck Reddig, the John Doe summons is a step to enable the IRS to uncover those who are failing to properly report their virtual currency transactions. We will enforce the law where we find systemic noncompliance or fraud. Um, yes, the court order grants the IRS permission to serve what is known as a John Doe summons. The United States petition does not allege that Circle has engaged in any wrongdoing in connection with its digital currency exchange business. Rather, the court, according to the court order, uh, the summons seeks information related to the IRS's investigation of an ascertainable group of, or class of persons that the IRS has a reasonable basis. You cut out there. Oh, I do not know why. Where did I cut cut off? A uh, reasonable, reasonable basis. basis. Uh, uh, let's see. A reasonable basis to believe uh, may have failed to comply with any provision of any internal review laws. Uh, and then on April second, the block reported that the IRS has also made a request to Kraken in the Northern District of California for the same time period and same conditions uh but according to the block the court has already responded saying that the government's request is overbroad and that it will have to refile a request with a narrowed scope interestingly enough you know what would be the funniest shit on earth to come out of a giant irs claw for information like this getting your ass kicked by a kraken no just finding out that this magic sea of millions of people that you think owe you all this tax money actually don't because most of them just bought bitcoin and held it and never sold it yeah <laughs> that too it it could just be something that they want in their database so if they decide to audit somebody they just cross-reference that database and if you happen to have your name in there then it's one more thing they can talk to you about i know but just imagine they do that and then go start fucking with people and most of the people can just point at like every single purchase they've made still sitting there somewhere on the blockchain and be like what do you mean what taxes i don't owe you taxes unleash the kraken I I just think it it would be hysterical if the percentage of holders versus spenders and users was actually that skewed 
that they spend all this money and go through all this shit and like only a tiny fraction of what they thought they could get out of it they can actually get yeah i mean if if they were smart and they only wanted to purely get a list of people who who didn't just buy they would have their request exclude transactions where it was just a buy request and nothing more but i don't think that's what this is this is an info grab most of the time mm -hmm. like it's somewhat rational to have it have the lower limit be 20k but also uh if you're <laughs> after 2017 if you're not excluding buys then you're yeah like as should be explained you're catching a bunch of people who only bought and only buying is not a taxable event i just want this one laugh out of out of this this government action just give me that one chuckle universe oh man speaking of chuckles i heard uh we all know mark zuckerberg's cell phone number now yeah so early last year, um, pretty much all of Facebook's um, account information, all of it was compromised. And I think it was around last January, somebody set up a Telegram bot that would let you query the entire user database based on phone numbers um, for money. And they had a whole system set up where you could you can get credits with the bot, and make queries, and get get credits debited, and um, yeah, all of that just leaked for free, completely out there um, a couple of days ago. So the entire Facebook database um, with names, phone numbers. Um, you know, things like account creation date, email addresses, location data, sometimes your birth date. Um, yeah, all of that is out there. All of it. The entire Facebook user base. COVID passports are a safe idea. We would never leak that data. I mean, dude, it's like, I just have this visceral vibe in the last year that there's this comic book called The Private Eye, um, like a sci-fi thing set like 80 years in the future, but there's no internet, there's no digital shit, everything has gone back to analog, and the whole reason for that was literally all of the cloud services and social media shit, all of it got hacked all of it got dumped like this and it just completely ruined everyone's life so the future is just like a totally analog world where it's like completely acceptable to just walk around in the equivalent of halloween costumes and just be totally pseudonymous like <laughs> the, the more i look around at data breaches like this it's like that crazy sci-fi comic uh doesn't seem so crazy Nobody has a good record at this. Um, even the credit reporting agencies have their databases dumped, which are probably the biggest databases on Americans out there right next to Facebook. Yeah, but it's like, I just don't think it's viscerally sunk in with most people yet that the asymptotic like end point of this is all of it is dumped out openly for everyone. Like, it's not just that company has all this data on you or that foreign nation states. No, it's just, it will, it will eventually hit the point where this shit is just out in the open. You can go get your little search index engine for it and just start looking through it all yourself. They're even going to be replicating my fingerprints. Damn it. And now everyone knows the big secret that I went to the school of witchcraft and wizardry. <laughs> and then graduate? I went yes and then I went to the college of Winterhold seriously no Skyrim fans here did they get yeah. your owl's name though uh, no I don't think so my owl is super private it's Marty's owl thanks well you just put it out there for everyone now yeah well it already was <laughs> 
It's like, yeah, this is, uh, yeah. Going to be a really rough future for people who just jump on the internet and put all of their personal, private, social information everywhere for everyone to see. It's nim time, boys and girls. Alrighty, though. You're up, Janine. Yes, so as usual, uh, despite being very busy in the last month, uh, as you probably noticed from me being gone, I still managed to publish my newsletter this month, so that is out now. It is much shorter than usual. I will try to fix that in the next month. <laughs> Everybody gets busy sometimes. But just yes, punks, go read. We forgive the close you get some other bragging rights we'll get to. I think after that, though, it's still you with a interesting, weird change of pace. You mean Tesla? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, at the end of March, a senior security engineer at Tesla tweeted that they had uh, reported multiple security vulnerabilities in the BTC pay server code and thank them for their prompt response and timely fixes and urged everyone to update ASAP to the new release version 1.0.7.1 uh, and then BTC pay server in announcing the release said we want to thank Tesla for submitting the disclosure that led to these fixes and helping us with remediation thank you for contributing to the community and helping us keep our users safe now there was no confirmation in this uh, about why Tesla uh, was doing this. Um, as far as I know, this is still speculation, but I can't imagine what other reason there might be for Tesla engineers to be reviewing the code for an open source Bitcoin payment processor other than maybe they're using BTC Pay Server for their Bitcoin transactions for Tesla cars. Very nice. Seems very likely. I mean, e even with all of his companies owning Bitcoin and his shift in attitude, I mean, that would just seem weird to have company employees just diving through Bitcoin stuff if they weren't using it. Walmart, we're looking at you. You're going to need to audit the code also. I mean, the one good thing is just knowing like that type of engineer is actually looking at shit like this because if you really sit and think about it like you want people being their own payment processors with something like bitcoin but you know software just in the architecture itself has scaling concerns you know what i mean if you, if you want some major company to actually be self-hosting and receiving payments um, in a world where payments really start shifting to Bitcoin, um, yeah, things like BTC Pay are going to need serious like scaling overhauls at different points to be able to handle X volume of transactions per time unit if that really starts scaling up to get used for payments more. Yeah, and if it's a Fortune 500 company that's using open source components, they also are very concerned about the security they're in. So it's great to see somebody come to the table and give something back. Mm -hmm. Just weird to say though, Tesla fixed a bug in Bitcoin software. Maybe Bitcoin will fix Tesla's balance sheet. <laughs> Speaking of lasers. Yeah. So this, um, this is probably one of the funniest um, security disclosures I have seen in this space. Um, it takes the form of a Twitter thread and a quick video complete with um, edited black screen that says ship to magic lab. <laughs> but um, TLDR, uh, Lazy Ninja discovered a physical attack. So it would require actually getting your hands on a cold card um, that would allow um, private key extraction. Caveat though. Um, the only vulnerable 
firmware version is 4.00. Um, the latest one where they just uh, moved everything over to Libsec uh, 256K1. So because of a goof in um, the code for that version, a function um, in generating the uh, the hash of what's stored in the secure element to uh, enter the pin and then allow the uh, the normal CPU to take the keys and start doing stuff with them was not called in establishing that secret in the secure element. So instead of requiring something from the secure element, the MCU and the user, um, it was not including the entropy from the MCU. So if you had access to a lab, um, the same type of equipment and expertise needed to break the Mark II um, in Ledger's disclosure, you could remove the secure element, um, bring that to your lab, and read slot three and one of the secure memory there. And pretty much um, that's where the information to let the uh, secure element talk to the MCU and get what needed or get what is needed to take the actual keys out of the secure element and decrypt them. Um, you can pretty much in that slot replace the pin hash that the user put there with your own. And because um, that function call was not made that should have been, um, Pretty much that that is enough to actually trick the MCU into unlocking its secrets and using them to decrypt the key. Because when you put the secure element back on the device, it now has the attacker's pin, which will pass the challenge and tell the MCU things worked out, like do stuff with the keys now, and actually allow you to recover the keys off the device. Now. Again, um, everything before 4.0.0 is not vulnerable to this. Um, the most recent um, firmware pushed after that has patched this. And for the second time, um, you literally need lab level equipment and expertise to actually pull off this type of attack, which requires you physically getting hands on the device. And in the process of doing this, not screwing up and destroying the chip. So, so far, cold card two for two in terms of the insane cost and equipment you need to actually break that device and extract keys. Are you sure that the 4.0 firmware plays a part of this as opposed to being a different bug? Because I was just looking at the video and they're using 3.1.2 in that video. Um. Well, Again, Lazy just dropped this in a tweet. Um, also, he specifically said at the end that he could have faked everything. Um, so you just have to trust his reputation. And then after that, um, said the this attack disclosure is 40% to help users and 60% for me to just brag. Okay, I'll give um, my <laughs> interpretation then. I don't think it has anything to do with the 4.0 firmware, but the bootloader, if it's 2.0 or before, is vulnerable to this. And somewhere else I heard somebody else saying that uh, it was either June or July of last year they started shipping bootloaders above that version. So if you have a Mark III that you bought June, July of last year and newer, it's not even vulnerable to this. And plus, you need a laser. Well, yeah, I, I might have misspoke. Um, it might be the bootloader, but like the core of the issue was that um, the function to actually take the entropy from the MCU and put that with the SEs and the users wasn't getting called. So like it just, that wasn't part of the actual end um, hash put in the secure element. Yep. But yeah, I, I just, I, I've got to love the part in the video where it's just like, send chip off to Magic Lab. If it takes 250 grand to attack your hardware, plus an attacker whose time is probably very valuable because they know how to run this type of equipment, then just make sure grandma never gets her hands on your cold card because she might fuck you up. <laughs> but yep. 
I mean, it's like, you know, I, I am not aware of any established hardware wallet in this space that has not had a successful key extraction attack pulled with physical access to the device. But I can't think of anything besides the cold card or potentially clones of it um, <laughs> that literally take this much cost and time and expertise to pull. You know what this news means, though, don't you? Mark IV's incoming! Rodolfo's <laughs> going to be eating steak for life, boys and girls. We are never going to quit giving him money. I literally have all the bags of all the open dimes I've ever bought stacked up on my desk so that I can look at them and remember how much of my Bitcoin that he has and tell myself, stop buying gaz- er, gizmos and gadgets. They're so fun, though. All righty, though. All right, so next one is interesting. PHP and Git servers. Yeah. So um, PHP um, maintains their own Git repository on their own self-hosted Git server, uh, which was compromised. Um, had two malicious commits um, push, um, I, th- I think it was a remote code execution vulnerability through the user agent in the HTTP headers. Um, and yeah, PHP um, runs the back end of like 80% of the internet. So that was really fun. Um, <laughs> nothing actually got pushed into a tag release or um, production um release or anything like that but yeah um these got slipped in and then caught a few hours later and uh yeah in response to this um php has moved all of their main repos um to the mirrors they maintain on github and that is now becoming the main repositories for everything and they have decided that that's just what they're going to do going forward because hosting their own Git server um, in their assessment after this is just too big of a security risk. Um, And so now everything's shifting over to GitHub and they will not grant membership um, to the organization on GitHub without 2FA enabled on a GitHub account. So yeah, a uh, potentially very close call for a large part of the internet. And um, yeah, um, I can't blame them um, for deciding GitHub is a safer way to host things and manage um, pull requests and commits now. But on the other side, doesn't this, if this just becomes the answer to things like this, make GitHub a giant gigantic honeypot yeah as if it wasn't enough one already it's it's like everywhere i look uh there is cyber warfare in one form or another everywhere like it's just the background noise at this point yeah it's hard to understate the um significance of a bug like this this would really open up just tons and tons of systems to attack Mm -hmm. everything is broken and everything needs to get unbroken fast or we're gonna see a digital 9 11 in the next few years yeah considering that some of the stuff we we see are you know multiple zero days stacked already you have to wonder how many of these types of things have made it into code bases unnoticed, either proprietary or open source at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of subversive attacks, the old uh, old boys over at Morgan Stanley uh, have now filed with uh, the SEC to enable 12 of their funds to host Bitcoin futures or GBTC. They say, to the extent a fund invests in Bitcoin futures or GBTC, it will do so through a wholly owned subsidiary, which is organized as an exempted company under the laws of the Cayman Islands. A fund may at times have no exposure to Bitcoin. So 
They don't have a custody solution yet, but they have enabled something like 12 of their internal funds that I'm sure they would offer you if you were a uh, wealthy client whose money they managed, uh, an opening to be exposed to BTC. Uh, just one more step in adoption. Seems like a good day for those funds to get in anyway, with QBTC's premium still negative. Though uh, Barry promised uh, Pinky swore this morning that uh, they were gonna get QBTC turned into an ETF. And so Morgan Stanley and some entities like that means it's probably gonna happen. Um, Small march to adoption. They need that exposure. Well, I mean, it's just with the current wave of ETF proposals and all of the institutional shifting we're seeing right now, um, it really does kind of feel different in the sense that those uh, those fat wallets that usually wind up in regulators and lobbyist hands um, are behind these things now. And it's not just internet crazy screaming, um, let us buy our stonks. Yeah, and I don't think anybody in GBTC wants an approximate proxy of Bitcoin's price. They would be very happy if it traded at exactly Bitcoin's price. So we now have a window until they do offer it, um, especially with the negative premium on the table for these funds or any individuals, say with 401ks or IRAs out there, to come in and get some GBTC at a negative premium, uh, which Sounds like a great buying opportunity to me. I've never had anybody offer me BTC for under the going rate. Nope. If I did, I'd be robbing a bank. If you can buy a dollar for 90 cents, do it all day long. <laughs> Ooh, speaking of dollars. Yeah, so this is fun. Um, Tether has dropped a uh, certified attestation from a accounting firm, Moore Cayman from the Cayman Islands, um, attesting to $35.28 billion in total assets as of February 28th, 2021, um, against 35.15 um, billion in um, outstanding liabilities. So again, um, more than 100% back. And they dropped this um, and partly in response to the settlement with the New York Attorney General's office. And soon, um, not sure when, uh, but early this month, they should be dropping another one, um, except itemized um, based on the individual assets um, being held as tether reserves as part of the um, settlement with the New York Attorney General's office, they have to do such disclosures um, or attestations quarterly for the next two years. Um, so yeah, um, they've done multiple attestations over the years, um, which is all any stable coin issuer has done um, because no firm will actually do full audits for them anywhere. And these years of, of shrieking tether needs to be audited while ignoring all the other stable coins like Paxos, like USDC. Um, so yeah, now they have an attestation just like the other stable coins from an accounting firm, the magic right kind of business. So yeah, uh, I, I imagine right now tether truthers are kind of just having their heads implode Wojak style shrieking into the night. At, and all the other stable coins continue to grow. I think a day or two ago, I saw a tweet that said 100 million more USDC got printed. The, the market continues to grow to match the general crypto market growing. Yep. I mean, like, I think the, uh, yeah, that settlement with the New York Attorney General's office, like, that was it. Like, I'm sorry, stable coins are here to stay. Like, the biggest, air quote, shadiest, most untrustworthy one. It's like multiple times proven backing. Um, multiple times been explicitly fucked with by the U.S. government. And this was the resolution to it.
Like these things are here. They're not going anywhere. You might be able to squeeze them with a little more regulation and shit, but they're not going anywhere. Deal with it. Sorry, boys and girls. The Fed may just prefer stable coins to issuing a CBDC. Because then they don't have to fucking care or worry about it. Or disintermediate their own customers, also known as commercial banks. Ding, 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 ding. Let's see, another financial news. CME Group is going to issue micro-Bitcoin futures contracts. What is a micro-Bitcoin, you ask? Well, I would not say you were wrong to ask with all the Bitcoin prefix mumbo-jumbo that's out there. In this case, a micro-Bitcoin future is going to be a tenth of a BTC, so 0.1 BTC. This is kind of cool. Uh, because their current contracts are for 5 BTC, and these days, that's kind of a rich man's game. So, starting May 3, pending regulatory approval, it says, uh, they will start trading these 10th BTC futures products. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the market adopts, prefers these to the 5 BTC size, and whether this affects the uh, ongoing contango play that is supposedly out there for selling the futures and buying spot and pocketing a healthy profit. You know, I think... <laughs> uh, it just seems to me like the most likely effect this would happen would be anyone trading with other people's money might be able to pull um, a lot more liquidity just in the sense that you don't need to get up all the way to a five Bitcoin basket to like pull other people's money into it. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how you deliver physical for the futures here. I haven't researched it. Um, certainly five Bitcoin contracts were outside of the realm of where I considered myself available to play. But if I could physically deliver a tenth of a Bitcoin, I could actually afford to buy that future should my brokerage account be enabled to do so. So I could actually capture arbitrage now personally. Um, so from that point of view, it may be the more savvy Bitcoiners out there are now able to do this for themselves. I'm not sure. We'll find out. I want to buy a house. Yeah, buddy. So the uh, crypto credit cards, there's been a lot of talk around that idea lately uh, with Gemini, with Fold, with uh, BlockFi, all uh, in some stage of offerings. Uh, now up in Canada, a company called Mogo now has a uh, platinum prepaid card and digital spending account that if you sign up with them for a home mortgage, they will give you cash back on said Visa card uh, to the tune of $3,100 that is somehow deposited into a Bitcoin reward account. I, I think I misstated this a little bit. I'm, I'm not quite sure how that card plays into this. They offer interest on Bitcoins in Canada, kind of like a BlockFi type thing. Uh, they also offer mortgages. So match, match made in heaven, right? Uh, if you get a mortgage with them, they will deposit up to $3,100 of Bitcoin into one of these interest accounts for you. Uh, I just thought this was interesting from the point of view that eventually I'm imagining Bitcoin will be good home mortgage collateral. And in fact, we had somebody claiming that there was a story on this this last week, but couldn't produce it. So, you know, ephemeral nonsense, surely. But uh, Canada, I, I salute you. This is uh, the right way to get people hooked. I mean, it's just like, I don't know. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like these kinds of things. I don't particularly like these kinds of things, but it is like a whole category of products and services in this space that are almost 
like completely designed and engineered around making hyper bitcoinization happen making that speculative attack against the dollar happen and it's just like in the last year or two like they're exploding everywhere it's definitely interesting as a savings vehicle to me because I think the example they give in there is you could get that $3,100 back in Bitcoin on a $350,000 home loan uh, at a 30 year mortgage. So if you actually held $3,100 worth of Bitcoin and you think you'll get two 10x appreciations in that 30 years somewhere, then potentially that. Bitcoin they just kicked back to you could pay off your house in there all by itself, which is just kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. But it's like, you know what I mean though? It's like these kinds of products and services are like specifically engineered to take some like revenue stream or some flow of money around a conventional financial product and just guarantee that that stream keeps flowing into Bitcoin. And that's just the whole net end result of these products. And it's just like insane to me. You know what I mean? Like people freak out about how like the government's going to ban Bitcoin. We're going to have a 6102 event like gold. And it's just like, look around you. Like the, the things literally that will cause hyper Bitcoinization that are that speculative attack on the dollar are literally being built out everywhere as Bitcoin consumer products with just total AOK. Yeah, I honestly appreciate how it teaches people to save that may not have had a habit such as that previously. And I think it's worth noting that 6102, if I'm remembering correctly, applied to US gold coins, which the treasury minted for people and ultimately had a call on in the, I don't even remember all the special status of US currency, but basically you're not supposed to deface it. So they called it home. So unless they come out and admit that the NSA invented Bitcoin, they have no justification to call it home certificates too like it, it was completely blanket but it's like you know that was then this is now and just look at all the differences in environment and more importantly the differences in responses to things like if the government's worried about the speculative attack on the US dollar, why the fuck isn't Congress banning like putting Bitcoin on your balance sheet? Why why aren't regulators like poking all kinds of holes and causing shit for like these rewards back in Bitcoin services and shit? They're not. Yep, we're getting deeply integrated. GBTC is the third most held security by millennials and the government is licking their chops at future tax revenue when we sell. So if you really want to stick it to the man, don't sell your Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. So yeah. Other tokenized abstractions. I really don't know how I feel about this. Um, so I still have not had the chance to um, find any actual kind of official prospectus or anything. So I'm probably going to dig around for that. And um, if I can actually find that, um, cover it again or go through what I don't cover now um, next week. But yeah, um, Blockstream has issued a liquid token, um, Blockstream Mining um, note, which is going to be backed by some portion of hardware they're operating in their co-location facilities. Um, this is pretty much a above board registered security version of cloud mining. Um, 
only non-US um, qualified investors can actually invest in this. Um, and I do believe it's um, registered out of Luxembourg. But effectively, this token has a minimum buy-in, um, I think, of 200,000 um, pounds acceptable in Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin on liquid or Tether. And the idea is pretty much um, you buy one of these tokens, which has a three-year um, maturation date, or three-year maturation date. Um, and is going to be sold monthly in tranches for 12 months. Um, and not starting mining until July 9th. Um, that's a big okay um, in my mind. So two months before that investment starts actually earning anything. Um, but yeah, um, the idea is that for that three... Um, year maturation period, all of the mining um, rewards from the equipment being operated um, backing these tokens will be tossed into cold storage and not distributed until the three-year maturation date. Now, um, yeah, one, I don't really like cloud mining stuff um, as a way to get involved in mining. There's no way around. Um, you're going to be paying more in operational and maintenance costs to give the operator a profit margin and cover their own costs for things. Um, so you're not just looking at equipment, electricity, etc. And um, yeah, cloud mining, as shady as almost all of the operations have been in the history of this space. Um, would pay out regularly. So even given that this is a legally registered security out of Luxembourg, and there actually is whatever protections or rights in that jurisdiction for holders of this, um, this is very different than traditional cloud mining in the sense of it's accredited investors, there's a minimum um, buy-in of 200,000 pounds. That's almost a quarter million dollars. And then this is a three year um, counterparty risk exposure. So like I trust the people at Blockstream now. I think they're a good company doing good things, but a lot can happen in three years in terms of people leaving, new people coming, um, regulatory landscape shifting um that is quite a long period of counterparty risk exposure um to me but really in the grand scheme of things um you know this is not something that's going to be accessible in any way to retail or small scale investors anyway um so just have to see how this plays out but yeah, um, I just don't like the direction this is going of breaking up physical hardware ownership, farms and things like that into like what some split board controlled thing or at least board owned thing. Like, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm worried there about the risks of scale condensing things more and more like that. And then the mining ecosystem just becomes more of a regulatory controlled, like collapsed, concentrated thing. So, yeah. This sounds something like a Bitcoin bond to me. Uh, it is interesting. They don't pay a coupon on it um there's there would be complexity with that to figure out who the token holder is and pay them that coupon uh so i imagine that means whoever holds the token at the end can turn it back in for that bitcoin and that's how that works which would allow people to sell it and essentially trade it like some sort of future on that pool of bitcoin 
I wonder if the chip shortage doesn't play into demand for this because maybe you're a mining operation and you've got a big pile of money and you'd like more miners, but you can't currently source them. I wonder if that wouldn't tempt somebody to get in uh, to a product like this. I mean, very potentially, but you know, I, I, I would say it's not like a bond just for the single reason that it's whatever the rewards are. And like what that winds up rather than like the denomination of the bond guaranteed back with interest. But like other than that, it is this a similar kind of like financial setup. Yeah, that's fair. It, it might be closer to an equity actually because you don't know that outcome. But yeah, I mean, just have to see how it goes. I just hope this does not go a bad direction like I think it could where you just have mining operations becoming large like conglomerates doing things like this. Yeah, I hear you on the centralization concern. Um, do you happen to know where Blackstream sources their miners? Um, actually, a few different companies. I know they've taken orders from um, Micro BT. They make the What's Miner. It was the spinoff from a Bitmain engineer. But they've also ordered some of Bitmain's most recent hardware, too. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this comes out. We need to spread mining out more, not concentrate it more. Alrighty though. I do believe that brings us to you, Janine, for the last two. Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned at the start of the show, one of the anniversaries today is the publication of the Collateral Murder video, which for anyone who doesn't know, uh, is a video that was released by WikiLeaks in April 2010, April 5th specifically, uh, of a U.S. military Apache helicopter basically shooting, uh, well, two Reuters employees plus people who are walking with them, and also then uh, a father and his two children who came to help the uh, one visible remaining person who was still alive and able to at least crawl on the ground. Um, and so, yeah, that was... a. Uh, if anyone hasn't seen that, you can find the original publication page at collateralmurder.wikileaks.org. Unfortunately, as people have noticed recently, um, the videos that they have on that page linked are hosted on YouTube, and YouTube has decided to age-restrict them. Um, so they don't show up in the embedding on that page anymore, but you can go to a different website called challengepower.info slash collateral underscore murder and you can find a page with a lot more um a lot more information about the kind of background of the video like things that were learned since the publication like the identities of the people killed and uh also i th i believe it also might include information about dean yates i am not sure it does include the 10th anniversary but um uh, but I don't, I'm not sure if, if it has it, but also for anyone who's interested, they should also check out the testimony by Dean Yates, uh, D-E-A-N-Y-E-A-T-E-S, I think, I can't precisely remember, but there's, uh, he gave witness testimony at the extradition trial about how he was the bureau chief of Reuters, um, at the time, and he had been one of the people who had tried to obtain, um, this this video and also other information related to the attack and through freedom of information requests and they were all blocked and basically the U.S. military said that nope they were insurgents we killed them blah 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 we're not giving you anything other than that um, and he at the end of his testimony commended Assange and Chelsea Manning for releasing this video because he says otherwise we would have never have known the truth even at, at one point he thought that it was uh, possible that they were telling the truth about them being insurgents and that, you know, he couldn't square reality with their claims. Um, so I recommend watching that video. Uh, 
if you haven't um i mean it's very emotional at least for me like every time i watch it it's hard to watch even though i've seen it multiple times but i do recommend it because it's an important piece of history and related to that um uh today an episode of what bitcoin did was published uh where peter mccormick interviewed uh john shipton and gabriel shipton who are uh assange's father and brother respectively and also kind of me i'm not sure exactly what my role is i was kind of uh information support person maybe <laughs> not sure but i uh, also gave a lot of commentary and uh the purpose of the episode um, from their perspective was to raise money for his legal defense because the deadline for the defense submission uh, in response to the U.S. appeal in the extradition case is, I believe, on the 7th. So um, the case is ongoing. They still need legal funds. And so that is the main driver of the episode getting published. Yeah, that I'm looking forward to listening to later when I have the chance Mayhaps, though, we could tell our listeners where they can help contribute to that. Yes, I believe the website is support. Let me bring it up really quickly. I think it's support. Uh, I tweeted it out a while ago. It is supportassange.valand.de, W-A-U-L-A-N-D.de. Um, so you can go there and it'll then redirect you to a longer URL, which has the donation page and there is a Bitcoin, uh, address option for that. All right. We will get that tossed in the show notes. So I guess that means final thoughts. Free Sanj. Budster. Yeah. Of, of all the despicable things our government's done. Occasionally, it's nice when they're recorded. Yeah, I'm assuming that's about a very specific Florida man who the media completely bullshitted about. Or did I miss the target? It, yeah, I'm really disappointed in the way Assange has been treated for being a journalist. And uh, I'm, I'm plenty disappointed in other things our government does, like now stick with agreements to pull out of places like Afghanistan and at forever wars and all those support sorts of things. Um, it's definitely something that's important to people and it basically gets ignored in public, which is too bad, which is why it's important to highlight occasionally, even if it's disturbing. Mm -hmm. Also, it's Thank you to Peter McCormick for making a 10,000, I think it was USD, or was it pounds? 10,000 something currency donation. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a nice corollary to the rest of the world to have journalists who actually give a fuck about journalism as opposed to <coughs> CNN um, that will do things like completely manipulate footage of an elected official to make it look like they're just getting bribed to make policy decisions and not air the entire, um, 45 second or so segment where he breaks down that he's not doing that, that said company he took a bribe from is not the only company involved with vaccine distribution. And that, in fact, um, companies like Walgreens and CBS that are also involved in things um, targeting old folks home and now shifting to general distribution um, when the media claimed they weren't. And it was just this one company that bribed him doing it because, you know, that's that's not journalism. That's um, it's propaganda. If you're watching it on TV, it's probably propaganda people. Mm -hmm. I had the unfortunate experience, I, had, I just have to bring this up, but I had the unfortunate experience of having to watch cable television last month because it was the only source of entertainment, and I have to say, I do not miss it. <laughs> I, I haven't watched cable television in a very, very long time, and wow, it has gone downhill, <laughs> even from where it was back then, but I was pleasantly... I don't know if I was pleasantly surprised. I was surprised to see that even cable television... Uh, in a rural area had um, 
Well, it played an ad for a cam girl website, which I have never seen in my life. That was quite amazing. I was very surprised that that kind of advertising content is allowed, but yes. Every time I'm around cable or TV with cable on it, I feel like Satan is jamming an ice pick into my brain. Yep, that's pretty accurate. Cam girls and uh, weed shops, now essential services. I, I did not see a single instance of the latter, but I did see at least two of the former. Throw the TV in the trash. You'll thank us. Oh, it was definitely not mine, and it will never be mine. Monitors, people. You want monitors. Alrighty, though. I guess that is our Avoiding Propaganda guidebook. And, uh... That's a wrap for the day, punks. Catch you later. Peace. Bye.